Welcome to Grading the Nutmeg, the podcast of Connecticut history, brought to you by the State Historian at UConn Hartford and Connecticut Explored, the magazine of Connecticut history. I'm Walt Woodward. No one knows more about transportation in Connecticut than historian, civil engineer, and highway and transportation planner Richard DeLuca. In this recent virtual lecture for Cheshire Public Library, presented in coordination with his new Wesleyan Press book, Paved Roads and Public Money, the second volume of his history of transportation in Connecticut, DeLuca underscores the inseparable relationships among population, technology, and the environment. Join me now for Connecticut in Motion, the story of our time with Richard DeLuca. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Bill Basil. I am the head of adult services at Cheshire Public Library. Today we have Richard DeLuca, who has done much research on transportation in Connecticut and has written two books. Today he will be speaking about how transportation has affected Connecticut's development, um, what it was like in the past, and you know perhaps what it's going to look like in the future. I'm very happy to have him here today. Welcome, everyone. What I'd like to do is tell you a story, a story that is extremely important, not only to Connecticut history, but as it turns out, it is, in a lot of ways, the story of our time. And it's one that we're going to hear more and more about. So I'm calling this Connecticut in Motion. But really, it's a story with three main characters. The characters are the population growth that has occurred in the state over the last 400 years. The technology that we use, not only for matters of transportation, but also how we sustain ourselves produce the things that we need and consume them. And of course, the last, the third character is the uh, natural environment. And we'll be concerned, of course, with the impact of the first two on the third. Before we get into the story itself, I want to give you two big ideas that you can kind of carry with you as we talk about the specifics. First of all, why do we even care about transportation? It's important not only from a historical perspective, but it literally makes our life possible. It makes possible all of the commerce and all the economic transactions that we need to sustain ourselves. And it makes possible all the social interactions. And we can see, thanks to the COVID virus, how we've had to adapt our social interactions because we cannot move to one location and share this experience. So we're using communication technology instead to make it possible. But just take a minute, wherever you're seated, look around the room and realize that everything in that room, including probably yourself, came from somewhere else. And it got there by making not just one, but several transportation experiences. It went from raw materials to manufacturer. Once it was made, it it went to a distributor somewhere. From the distributor, it went to a retailer. And from the retailer, presumably, into your home or room, wherever you are. It's something we take so much for granted, but it is at the foundation of all our social interactions. Well, how does transportation even work? There's one basic idea that we're going to be talking about through all of this, and that's the fact that transportation technology, whatever form that may be in, is used to convert some form of energy into motion. Now, that form of energy has changed quite a bit over the last 400 years, and we'll talk about that. But at the uh, foundation, it's all about using technology to convert energy into motion. This is a photo of the Bristol Ferry in uh, Windsor. And you'll notice what is not a cable, actually, that is secured on both shores. This is crossing the Connecticut River. And it actually is a piece, a little ingenious piece of technology 
that the ferry master was using to propel himself across the river. There's a cable and pulley system in place. And when the ferry gets going, the pilot of the ferry angles the boat so that it takes on the current of the river. The energy comes from the water and the cable guides the ferry to the proper place on the opposite shore. Quite ingenious. There were two or three ferries like that in Connecticut. Okay, so we know that energy is essential to transportation and its conversion in some fashion. And so if you look across the 400 years, you're going to see this story changing energy sources several times, beginning, of course, with the basic energy source in the, in the colonial period, which was animal power, horse, oxen, whatever. Okay, and of course, the wind and the tides. But aside from that, mainly animal power. Okay, and then we're going to move on in the 19th century to steam first, and then by the end of the century to electricity, and then in the 20th century to a new form of energy that's discovered to power the automobile, and that's crude oil refined into gasoline. Let's pick up the story at the end of the colonial period. So right right after these 13 former English colonies achieved their independence in the late 1780s and finally had to find a way to make themselves into a new nation. And this is a cover photo, by the way, of my first book called Post Roads and Iron Horses. Both of these books were published by Wesleyan University Press and are available either directly from the university or from uh, Amazon.com, end of commercial. So one of the first things that, as you can imagine, at the end of the revolution, the road system in Connecticut was was in, almost entirely dirt roads, and the power behind the vehicles was animal power of some sort. Well, one of the first things they had to do if these 13 separate, formerly separate colonies were going to try to act as one nation together, they had to establish some sort of an economic interdependence so that they could develop either regional economies or eventually a national economy. And key to that was keeping their roads, dirt though they were, in reliable condition so that people could travel and goods could travel longer distances reliably and relatively cheaply. And what they did was they turned to private corporations and they, the state of Connecticut incorporated uh, turnpike companies. So private investors who bought stock in a particular enterprise, let's say right here in the middle of the photograph, this is the Hartford and New Haven turnpike between those two cities. Um, and the responsibility of the turnpike company was to keep the road in good repair. And of course, in New England, that was not the easiest job between the ice and the rain, um, but they, they did that, and in return for their efforts and the money that they put into uh, maintaining a particular section of roadway, they were allowed to collect a toll from the people and the, uh, uh, they used uh, the facility. So these were all toll roads, and as you can see, there were just over a hundred that were actually built in different portions of the state. Um, but very few, perhaps 10% only, actually turned the profit for their investors. Keeping the roads up was a very expensive proposition. And of course, this also includes any bridges that were along your particular route. Uh, so it was an expensive 
uh, proposition, and the very few of the companies even broke even. Uh, those that did it was mainly because they happened to be in a great location, and they tended to have the longest existence. But by the end of the 19th century, the 1890s, uh, most of the roads had been returned to public use. Who benefited most from these turnpike roads were the people who used them, either the cargo companies who loaded wagons and shipped goods or stagecoaches, which began to appear shortly after and uh, carried passengers along the turnpike system. Um, the, uh, the note at the bottom references a fellow by the name of Levi Pease. The turnpike system itself was broken up into many, or a hundred or so different pieces. Well, Levi Pease came along and uh, started to consolidate the stagecoach businesses that ran on all of these different pieces. And he managed to do so throughout Southern New England. And uh, by doing so, was able to reduce the travel time from New York to Boston, which at the beginning was six days. He managed to cut that in half to three days. And I'll ask you to take a, a moment and just try to realize what life was like if you took six days to get from New York to Boston. Um, this is a picture taken in 1900 of the Boston Turnpike near Willington, Connecticut. The building on the left is a tavern. Of course, these turnpike roads were, uh, you know, that was a related business because many of the early journeys were overnight excursions so you had to have some place to feed and sleep the passengers and uh on often the fellow or the the persons who operated the stagecoach also had a financial interest in the taverns and the inns that became the stops along the route so you can see the beginnings of an economy developing here and one of, let's just for a moment, uh, we don't normally think of impact on the environment from stagecoaches and other vehicles of the period. But this is sort of a very prescient comment by Noah Webster, who, was ma who made it in 1817. And he's looking at the consumption of all the wood that everybody is using. And Connecticut, of course, when it was first settled, was uh, heavily forested from, from uh, border to border, like much of New England. But as it became settled and turned into farmland, most of those trees, perhaps as many as 80 percent, disappeared. And uh, the result was increasing spring flood levels on the Connecticut River so that the the city of Hartford had to look forward to increasing flood levels most every spring. So Noah Webster was aware of that, and he, he made this comment saying that, look, if we can't bring our annual consumption into line, which at the time was about 30 to 40 cords of wood per family per year, if we can't bring that in line with the amount of wood that grows every year, we're the time will arrive when we must search the bowels of the earth for fuel. And he didn't know how accurate he was being there. Uh, but the, the point of view was that the philosophy of, of the day told him that, you know, nature tells us that we should live within our means or sooner or later, and we're going to have to adapt our manner of life to our circumstances, okay? And we're going to find that out 
through several hundred years of history. Now, here comes the first big change in power and energy sources for transportation as well as manufacturing, and that's the steam engine, which appears in the early 19th century. And again, here is a, this picture is probably from post-Civil War days when Long Island Sound had all manner of large steamboats sailing back and forth from New York to Providence to Boston and all places in between. You can notice here, this is the actual steam engine seated in the middle of the boat with the rocking arm moving the, the two cylinders that are pumping this, this uh, turning this axle that's spinning the, the paddle wheel on the side. Okay, and one of the reasons the, uh, the steam engine, although it was developed uh, for use on land, usually in, in drawing excess water from, uh, from mine shafts and things of that sort, um, it first came into real uh, transportation use on the water because it was such a heavy and bulky apparatus that it took the weight of the water to kind of, uh, you know, make it feasible to carry and power a huge steam engine. Then the question became uh, something that wasn't answered for another 20 years or so. Question became, well, how can we use this power that's so heavy on the land? You know, we can't make a steam wagon, you know, although many people tried, it's just not practical. So they came up with the idea of running metal wheels on a metal rail to reduce um, the amount of surface friction that the vehicle had to deal with. So this way you could put the water tank where you're boiling the water to get the steam, you could lay it horizontal, put it on wheels, and you can generate enough power using coal as your main source to pull uh, an entire train of vehicles behind you. And so from the primitive steam locomotive comes what we normally think of as a steam train. This is a, a photo of the uh, shoreline on the shoreline railroad um, in Connecticut. Uh, again, probably from the late 19th century. And just to check back into our travel time here, now you could go from by steam train from New York to Boston in 1860 in eight hours, not eight days. And so the railroad was so popular so key to the uh, industrial revolution and, and the, the general growth of the economy in the 19th century, that by the end of the century, there were over 100 miles of uh, railroad built in Connecticut. Each of these lines designates, of course, a particular railroad. And Unlike the, the turnpikes, the railroads were so crucial to business that one railroad company, in this case, the New York New Haven, uh, merged with the Hartford and New Haven to create what would become one of the largest monopolies in New England transportation, the New York New Haven and Hartford Railroad. Eventually, the New York, New Haven, and Hartford uh, had control of virtually all of the railroads in southern New England, uh, all of Connecticut, then it branched out into Rhode Island and southern Massachusetts. So you could see this was really big business. And it was the railroad, of course, that made not only uh, speedier uh, 
uh, travel available to the ordinary passenger, but it made the entire industrial revolution possible because it could carry huge supplies of uh, bulk raw materials or afterwards of manufactured goods virtually anywhere in the country by the end of the century. And this is a photo of the Lyman Viaduct, which is in uh, eastern Connecticut in Colchester, I believe. Um, and it was on what was the shortest railroad route in miles between New York and Boston. And uh, by 1886, the New England, uh, the New, New York New England Railroad ran something they called the New England Limited. A, an express train of the period that made it from New York to Boston in s only six hours. Phenomenal, a phenomenal improvement from not even a hundred years before. Another form of energy appears at the end of the century in the 1890s, and that's electricity. And that leads, of course, to the trolley the electric street railway that became as popular for shorter trips and, and, and uh, trips within cities uh, as the railroad did uh, for trips between cities. And there was, again, an entire network, an infrastructure of trolley routes that was built all around Connecticut another 1,000 to 1,200 miles of infrastructure to satisfy the needs of, in many cases, the European immigrants who were drawn to America to, to work all of the factory jobs that the railroad made possible. So th there was a definite connection between the ability to move around between home and work uh, in the post-Civil War period, and the, and the thousands and th hundreds of thousands of people that were drawn to Connecticut to work those factory jobs. So you can see how by the end of the 19th century, between steam and electricity, what used to be mainly an agricultural or farm state is being transform into what you might call an urban industrial state. And if you just look at some of the statistics, in 1800, the total population of the state was 250,000. A hundred years later, it's nearly a million, nearly four times as many people. And the odd thing about the Industrial Revolution is that the growth, unlike agriculture, which sort of spread people out across the land more or less evenly, the Industrial Revolution concentrated people in the center of urban areas, of cities, where we had 50 people per square mile 100 years later, again, nearly four times as many. And the odd part is that not only did the population increase so dramatically, but look at the percents living in cities, only 10% in 1800, nearly 60% in 1900. So you can imagine the, all of the population that's coming in between in these hundred years, they're not going to some nice suburban setting somewhere. They're going right into the heart of some of the biggest cities in the state, like Bridgeport and New Haven, and Hartford, New London. Probably less than 10% of the land area of Connecticut is holding more than half of all the people that live here. And they're tied there, by the way, because it's a reasonable commute, if you will, from where they're able to live to where they are able to work. Why don't we take a little stretch break and come back to talk about the 20th century, and in particular, 
that new transportation machine, the automobile, and the internal combustion engine. I'm Walt Woodward, and I want to tell you about a brand new initiative by the Office of the State Historian and Connecticut Humanities. It's called Today in Connecticut History. Every day of the year at todayinctshistory.com, we tell you about a fascinating, often little-known event that happened on that very day in the past. Todayinctshistory.com provides an article, great images, and audio about the event from our daily WNPR broadcast. You can even subscribe to receive a morning email telling you what big event happened in this state on that date. This is your history, and it's worth knowing, and I hope you'll visit todayinctshistory.com soon. Todayinctshistory.com, because big things happen in this state on this date. Let's pick up this story at the turn of the 20th century, around 1900, with all these Uh, Nearly a million people, or half of them, uh, living in perhaps a dozen different Connecticut cities, surrounded by this open space farmland and orchards and agricultural fields of one type or another. And along comes a new form of energy. It's called the, the technology is called the internal combustion engine, and the fuel that it uses is crude oil refined into gasoline. So that makes possible two new modes of transportation uh, that are going to have a tremendous impact on uh, on the 20th century. The first, of course, is the automobile, and the, the second the uh, the airplane. We're not going to talk much about aviation. It, it happened in Connecticut pretty much the same way it happened everywhere else. But the story of the automobile in Connecticut tells an interesting tale. And of course, the first thing you need to remember when you think about the automobile is that the automobile is only half of the transportation equation. The other half are decent roads, okay? And in in case of the automobile, that means a hard paved surface of some kind that doesn't turn to mud when it rains and that is available year-round. Connecticut built yet another system of transportation infrastructure, in this case, what's called the trunk line system or, or the, the, uh, the network of paved roads between the 19 teens and the early 20s. And as you can see, in addition to the infrastructure, the network of railroads and the network of trolleys on top of that, we have yet another network of paved highways. But with a major major difference this time instead of place or looking to private corporations to build and maintain this infrastructure the state itself said it would do it because these are roads this is a public responsibility so the state of connecticut uh beginning in 1895 took on responsibility in conjunction with the towns of building and maintaining a trunk line system of highways. And by trunk line, we mean basically the most important uh, as opposed to local roads. Uh, These are the roads that got you uh, across and through Connecticut. And you can see most of these dark lines are in the major travel corridors that we've always had, Route 8, Route 7, Route 5 in the middle of the state, Route 2 down to Norwich, and so on. Okay, this is a tremendous responsibility for the state to take on. Here we are barely 20 years later, and this is what 
downtown Hartford looks like in front on Asylum uh, Avenue in front of the railroad station there. Okay, and you've got now not just one mode of transportation anymore, not just the railroad, not even just the railroad and the trolley, but you've got the private automobile, you have a touring bus here in the front of the photograph and a truck off on the side. So you've got, you know, a really multimodal situation here, uh, which is something that we strive for today and haven't reproduced in the same fashion. But the problem with this picture, although it looks ideal, there's all sorts of different modes at your disposal for moving around. The trouble is this bus company, the trolleys, and the railroads were all owned by the New Haven Railroad at this point. And so the monopoly that took over Connecticut transportation from the private sector was itself in bad financial shape in, by the 1920s, mainly because it had, let's just say, the financial shenanigans of J.P. Morgan and Charles Mellon, who were the respectively the banker and president of the New Haven, and who purchased, who went out and expanded the company by purchasing all of these other related transportation companies to create what they felt was going to be a, uh, a more efficient monopoly on transportation and therefore more profitable. The problem was they didn't have the money to do it legally. So they created all sorts of shell corporations and uh, sales from one company to the other within the New Haven uh, empire such that they could show profits on paper, but not in the bank. And they used those paper profits to buy up all of these other companies until about 1914, when the Interstate Commerce Commission finally caught on and uh, forced the New Haven to divest itself of its other corporations. Um, and so this, although it looks great as a photo, was financially a very unstable situation. And here's, in a sense, uh, the railroads, and, and this is not just about the New Haven, of course, this was happening to a lot of railroads in a lot of different states. The competition wasn't quite fair. You know, they were, they were competing against the automobile, the bus, the truck, all of which uh, passengers and material the New Haven had been carrying. And now, while the, while the railroads still have to build and maintain their own tracks and stations and other infrastructure, uh, the state is using public tax dollars to build new highways so that Anybody who could afford an automobile um, is able to leave the mass transportation of a railroad or a trolley and go door to door in something they themselves own. And I should also point out that while this was happening in the state of Connecticut, the federal government was doing the same thing. The way most of these roads are being built by the state of Connecticut, some of them are so important because they are interstate roads. They go from one state to the other that the federal government is paying for their maintenance and construction. And that would include any road that has a U.S. designation like U.S. Route 1 or Route 5 or Route 7. Okay. These are so there's now a partnership between the federal government and the state government, and together they've got what they've got a monopoly on highways. Um, and they're using public tax dollars to pay for it all. 
Well, what sounded like an ideal situation soon turned into a real problem, and people started to notice automobiles brought with them a particular problem that hadn't been prevalent before, and that is congestion. All right, there's certain times of the day, maybe certain days of the week, in this case, maybe a nice Sunday, Sunday afternoon, when there are so many cars on the road that the road can't handle them efficiently. And so you wind up with this new phenomenon called the traffic jam. Well, that kind of, that, that really kind of confused engineers at first. And they came up with a solution that's both new and old at the same time. And this is something called the limited access highway that might almost be considered a new mode of transportation. It's limited access, so people only can get on and off at certain points. And in between, they can move much more quickly because they don't have to worry about anybody coming in from the side of the roadway, all right? And if that reminds you of anything that we've just been talking about, it's because what they've done is created a cement railroad for automobile. You know, you get on and off at certain points only, and in between, your speed can be much greater because you have no danger from the side of the road. And the way that the states started to build limited access highways, the federal government did the same thing. And they came up with the idea of an interstate system that would traverse the entire country. This was in 1944. While we're at war, and they're planning to build 42,000 miles of interstate highways that will bring this new cement railroad to virtually every corner of the country. Now, they made two critical decisions at the time that weren't really going to show their, their, uh, their true colors for another 20 years or more. The first was that they decided that since people wanted to be most of the traffic was in the center of crowded urban areas, will run these new highways right through the urban centers. The amount of damage that a highway of this size, it obviously has much more of an impact on a local neighborhood than would a new, say, city street. It's very disruptive, and yet we're building them through the center of every major city in the country, or we're planning to at this point. The other decision was actually a lack of a decision. They knew they didn't want toll highway because this was public money that was being used, but they couldn't decide exactly how to pay for it in 1944. So they simply didn't. They let everybody know, all of the state highway departments, that here's the mileage that we're going to build in your state. We're just not sure quite yet how we're going to pay for it or when we're exactly going to build it. But of course, right after the war, the problem was there. The traffic was mounting. The population was growing in the, what became known as the baby boom generation. So states took it upon themselves to solve their most immediate problems And they started building their own interstate highways, if you will, or expressways, another another word for them. Um, The first one of any magnitude in Connecticut was the Connecticut Turnpike from Greenwich to the Rhode Island border at Killingly. All right. That's something that was done in the early 1950s. And it was done um, at an astounding cost of four hundred and. $50 $50 million for 128 miles of roadway. Well, how was the state ever going to pay for that? Well, the state said, look, the federal government may not want tolls, but we don't really care. It seems like a very logical way to pay for this, for highways that are this expensive and are going to carry so much traffic. So they did. They, they 
created the Connecticut Turnpike as a toll road and planned to use the toll revenue to pay off the construction bonds, the money that they had to borrow to build the road. And by the mid-60s, the state had a plan to build an entire network again for this new mode of transportation, the cement railroad. So another roughly uh, six, 800 miles of limited access expressways to be built, again, pretty much in all of the major travel corridors in the state. The, The federal government is going to play eventually a role in all of this. Let me just mention, when this was first developed, this idea of a limited access network for all of Connecticut, the state had intended to pay for it. Remember, the federal government was not involved through the collection of tolls, as it had done with the Connecticut Turnpike. It certainly didn't have the cash to pay for this many miles of expressway that are this expensive to build. But in 1956, the federal government, in the, in the, at the beginning of what would be a tremendous population boom in the 1960s, they decided, well, you know what? We, we won't use toll. We don't like the idea of tolls. But what we will do is tax gasoline and use the gas tax money to fund the interstate system. So as soon as the federal government did that, the states backed off of their toll ideas as a source of revenue and created, uh, or not created, but uh, planned to use their own gas tax revenues to support this new transportation network. So gasoline became the source of revenue or the sale of gasoline became the source of revenue to build the modern expressway system in uh, virtually the entire country as well as Connecticut. If you can remember back to Noah Webster in 1817 warning us of living within our means and as far as nature is concerned and not using more resources than is uh, than are good for us. Well, by the 19 19- 40s and 50s, the idea that growth and the natural environment had any sort of limits at all was really not known and certainly not proven as far as science was concerned. In the immediate post-war years, everybody is spraying DDT everywhere and thinking they had found the scientific answer to all of our mosquito and other insect problems. Well, um, the companies who made DDT certainly thought that way. But as science, as the science began to catch up with the technology in 1962, I believe it was, Rachel Carson published a book called Silent Spring that turned this idea on its head. And she brought into the popular culture the idea that when you're damaging or impacting nature and the natural environment in a negative way, you're also impacting human society in a negative way. Okay. We as individuals and as groups and as a culture depend ultimately on the natural environment for our own sustenance. So you poison nature, you're poisoning yourself. So let's just look at what Connecticut had become by the year 2000, in large part thanks to the automobile and the airplane. We now went from 1900, a population of nearly a million, to 3.4 million people, 700 per square mile. But now the automobile has taken all all of that concentration of people that lived in the city, and it has managed to spread them out more across the landscape in what is now a suburban and post-industrial state. So now only about less than 40 percent, where it had been a high of in the 60s, 40% 
less than 40% of the people in the state live in urban areas. And again, the numbers are, are not always easy to visualize, but if you look at it by the millions, okay, um, it took Connecticut 300 years to collect its first million inhabitants. So by 1910, the population was a million. It only took 40 years or ni- till 1950 to collect another million. So now we're at 2 million. Then it only took 20 years to 1970 to collect its third million. So that gives you an idea. It's doubling in size, 300 years to 40 years to 20 years. And that, if you just look at these two numbers alone, will give you an, uh, uh, a feel for just how powerful the, ba- the post-war baby boom really was. Changes were happening everywhere. There was construction, not just of highways, but of everything. Suburban uh, housing development, schools, university, everything. All public services were growing at a phenomenal rate to serve all of these people who, unlike this first group, are not for the most part, immigrants, but homegrown population increase. And what's really driving this home by the end of the 60s are the photographs that we're getting back from all of the Apollo missions to the moon. Uh, Everyone thought we were going to the moon to learn something new. As it turned out, we learned the most by just looking back at what was already here. And these whole earth images brought into the public consciousness together with books like like Rachel Carson's uh, Silent Spring. They've made they brought an environmental awareness into the public consciousness that we never, except for Noah Webster, probably never had as a society. So that all all of these new highways are just creating, they're not solving anything. They're just creating more traffic, more smog, and more gasoline or crude oil consumption. So how do we respond to this as a society? Well, in the 1960s, both Connecticut and the U.S. government, uh, so in in, uh, Hartford as well as Washington, They take the responsibilities for all different modes of transportation, including the old railroads and the old buses and trolleys, and put them all, and the highways, and put them all under one giant agency called the Department of Transportation. Not the Department of Highways anymore, but the Department of All Transportation. So we created, in effect, uh, uh, a public monopoly that J.P. Morgan would have been extremely proud of, I think, uh, in the 1900s. And now, of course, we're, we're up against the same problem he had. How are we going to pay for all of this? Oh, this is our own, just to, as a reminder, there was a lot of protest in the 60s specifically against building highways. And this was Connecticut's, uh, it happened all over the country, but this was Connecticut's claim to fame at the time. This interchange here at the bottom of the picture, this is Interstate 84 in uh, West Hartford near uh, West Farms Mall, which is right off the picture here. This is that major interchange that was built for what was going to be Interstate 91 that would circle Hartford uh, by going through West Hartford, okay? And you could see that road was actually stopped. The construction was stopped by public protest because 291 was headed around all of the suburban housing developments right through the West Hartford Reservoir. And the public complained and the environmental groups complained. And so eventually, at the height of this awareness, the importance 
of the natural environment. They were able to stop the construction of this particular highway rather than bring it through the open space of the reservoir lands in West Hartford. And part of the problem, part of the problem with all of this is that the plans were made in the 40s, okay, during the war. And the money didn't begin to flow until the 1950s. And it takes a good 10 years for people to start to see that this isn't really, doesn't seem to be working out. All right. So there's a lag time, a historical lag time that causes this public unrest in the 60s against ideas that were being formulated more than 20 years before. Okay. So the, the, the net result of all of this, I don't know if any of you remember the comic strip Pogo in the 60s, but Pogo became, this became the classic uh, rallying cry of those folks who realized and protested to support environmental awareness. This is Pogo and his friend trying to take a walk through the primeval forest uh, for it, just to enjoy the beauty. And they can't quite seem to do it because they're walking on all of this trash left behind um, everywhere. And of course, the punchline is, as uh, Pogo says, we have met the enemy and he is us. And that that's truly the end of the, of the story. It took us 400 years, but we came to the same realization as a society in the 1960s, as Native Americans, for the most part, had four or 500 years before, that we are not separate from nature, that we cannot grow and use technology without limits, that there are, in fact, natural limits, and that by exceeding them, we're only hurting ourselves, not the planet. As George Carlin so famously said, you know, people are trying to save the planet. The planet is just fine. We're the ones that might be screwed in the end. So the idea that uh, people have realized this before, and uh, in the 30s, it was expressed by Aldo Leopold, who was a famous American conservationist, who said that, you know, our tools are not only better than we are, but they're growing better much faster than we are, all right? And yet, for all of the so-called progress, they do not suffice for the oldest task in human history, to simply live on a piece of land without spoiling it. Well, I think today we realize that the problems are, are much beyond a piece of land, although that's how it might have appeared in the 1930s. We could easily say today that we haven't figured out how to live on the planet without spoiling it. The problems are now global. Uh, they're certainly not limited to even to America. And as uh, Henry David Thoreau said in the... Uh, 1830s, I'll just leave you with this, that we keep thinking we have to change things, but things don't change. We change. So somehow we've got to adapt our society, our culture, our civilization to the new reality of what growth and technology truly cause. Thanks for listening. You can buy Richard DeLuca's new book, Paved Roads and Public Money, at your local bookstore or your favorite online retailer. And for more great Connecticut history stories every morning, subscribe to todayincthistory.com or read and subscribe to Connecticut Explored magazine at ctexplored.org. This is Walt Woodward, hoping you'll join us next time for another episode of Grading the Nutmeg.